But I understand that, you know, he sends all kinds of reports over to you to, about me and about the Department of Justice. Not any that I've seen. What well, are you about? Well, I just understand that, that uh, he's about the planning and plotting things. But he hadn't, he hadn't sent me any report on you or on the Department any time. I had understood that he had, that he had, had uh, sent reports over about me no, plotting no. the overthrow of the government by force and violence. No, no. Leading no. a coup. No, that's, a, that's, a, that's an error. He never has said that or indicated or given any, any uh, indication of it. As I say, we'll all get through. Okay. Yeah. I'll talk to you Fine. in a day or two. Fine. Bye. He did have a back channel. He read them... I think to make him feel a little more comfortable uh, with what he thought were his enemies, He'll have a little more information on his enemies. They would be hand carried to a male assistant and the president would read them in the presence of that man and hand them back to that man. Dallas was to become forever linked with the murder of the president. But the rich and powerful men who had met in secret the night before had everything to gain from his death. LBJ was fearful of a long prison sentence, J. Edgar Hoover of losing his job, and the oil men of losing millions of dollars. When the shots rang out on Elm Street the next day, those problems were solved. The shock of Kennedy's assassination and its brutality reverberated around the world, but not everyone was grieving. The mood in the Murchison family home was very joyous and happy. For a whole week after, like champagne and caviar flew, every day of the week. But I was the only one in that household at the time that uh, felt any grief for his assassination. After the president's murder, Hoover had absolute control of the cover-up. All the physical evidence relating to the crime was swiftly removed to Washington. I had a request, and I, I have it here, where Mr. Wade requested uh, said I request that you turn all of the evidence obtained in the investigation of Lee Oswald's assassination of the president over to the FBI for mailing to Washington. We're turning all of our physical evidence over to the FBI. This was on the direct orders of the head of the FBI, J. Edgar Hoover. From the beginning, Oswald was promoted as the lone nut assassin. But in LBJ's home state, tongues were wagging. I met Lyndon on New Year's Eve at the Driscoll Hotel in Austin. And the people in Dallas, I mean, everyone was talking about Lyndon Johnson was the cause of the assassination, and it made my heart very heavy. I just couldn't believe that he could be a part of something so, so bad. So I confronted Lyndon. I said, Lyndon, you've got to tell me, were you part of the assassination? And of course, he had a high temper fit, uh, hit the wall, and and he was very irate and angry and he said no I was not but the oil pe or he called them he, the fat cats of Texas that I knew and the intelligence was the cause of the assassination I am sure Lyndon did not make the plans per se but he had the key people that he could call to actually do it if the head of the FBI and the head of the Secret Service and key lieutenants of those two figures are involved in covering up, plus the President of the United States and all his cronies. You don't need a massive conspiracy to get away with this. After the assassination, Cliff Carter, Johnson's aide, made repeated calls from the White House to the district attorney in Dallas, Henry Wade. He was instructed to look no further than Oswald for the guilty man. There was no conspiracy. A similar call was made to the Attorney General of Texas, Wagoner Carr. Then we have Lyndon Johnson himself calling the Chief of Homicide, Will Fritz, who's really doing the dirt work as far as interrogating Oswald and trying to get to the bottom of this case. He calls him and tells him, you have your man. You have your man. Let it go at that. Lyndon Johnson is trying to control 
what is going on with the investigation of the assassination of President Kennedy from Washington, D.C., with, with crucial figures in the case. The late Dr. Charles Crenshaw experienced the new president's controlling hand. He was in the operating theater at Parkland Hospital with his colleagues, working to save Oswald's life after Jack Ruby had shot him. He was urgently called to the phone in an adjoining office. I picked up the phone, and it was there I heard this voice like thunder that stated, this is the president, Lyndon B. Johnson. And he asked, how is the accused assassin doing? I was so uh, startled. The thing that I could say was he's holding his own. He's lost a large amount of blood. He said, would you take a message to the chief operating surgeon? It was more of an order than a question. So I said, yes, sir. He said, there is a man in the room. I would like for him to take a deathbed confession. And all of a sudden, the phone uh, went off. Uh, I returned to the operating room. I tapped Dr. Shires on the shoulder. He looked at me like, what are you talking about? Everyone was working feverishly in the abdomen trying to correct the wounds there. I said, guess who I've been talking to? I said, the President of the United States called and wants that man over there to take a deathbed confession. And Shires looked at me like uh, I was crazy. And we both realized that there was no way Lee Harvey Oswald, had he survived, would have been able to give any testimony until two or three days after the procedure. But still in all, the president had called and I did relay the message. When Dr. Crenshaw published his story in 1992, he suffered an avalanche of criticism. It was argued that Johnson made no such call. Crenshaw's critics were proved wrong by a former chief switchboard operator at Parkland Hospital, Phyllis Bartlett. The call came in and said, uh, hold the line for the president. And for a second, I couldn't, you know, I was still thinking Kennedy and I didn't, I was kind of taken back for a minute and then I, in a few seconds, it was just a matter of a second that he came on in a loud voice. He said, this is Lyndon Johnson, connect me to the accused assassin's doctor. It sounded the same as it had been on newscasts when I would hear him speak. I knew I had put a call to the operating room, so I contacted Dr. Crenshaw and I told him, I said, I, that I knew he did get the call and that I was sorry that the people had, in the newspaper and on the TVs, had tried to discredit him. And that was when I spoke out. From the moment he became president, Johnson had authority over every aspect of the cover-up of Kennedy's murder. He was unassailable. Johnson has the power to contain the investigation, both nationally and locally, on the ground in Texas more so than if it had happened, let's say, in Oregon or Wisconsin, Texas. Uh, he's got the power to give the CIA what it wants as president, as opposed to Kennedy, who they feared. He's got the power to take the National Security Action Memorandum that Kennedy had signed in November 1963, tear it up, reverse it, and create a war where three million soldiers wound up going to Vietnam instead of 16,000 being brought home by JFK. He can make J. Edgar Hoover director of the FBI for life. He's the man in the middle. The only person that can answer all of the questions of who's at risk, who's going to gain the most, who wins in this deal, there's only one answer to that question, and that's Lyndon Johnson. And his ticket out was Elm Street. One of the most compelling pieces of evidence linking Johnson with the assassination is through his henchman, Malcolm Wallace, the convicted killer of Douglas Kinzer. In the hours following the assassination, on the sixth floor of the Texas School Book Depository Building by the southeast corner window, the Dallas police discovered an unidentified fingerprint. The fingerprint, the fingerprint, 
is the ultimate part of the Mac Wallace story. The FBI fingerprinted every Texas School Book Depository employee, including the women employees who worked downstairs, never handled the boxes. They fingerprinted every Dallas officer that was in the sniper's nest so that they could remove those fingerprints from consideration. At the end of the day, you have one fingerprint remaining. It sits in the National Archives for 35 years, until 1998. An investigator takes it to a highly qualified search